As I said, we're going to be in John 9, and I'm going to read a big chunk of scripture, and uh, because it's a wonderful story, but also it's sometimes really good just to hear the Word of God. And so uh, strap in and, and listen in and listen to this story. Uh, this comes in, in the heels of all that we've been working our way through the book of John, just after the Feast of Tabernacles and all the stuff that Jesus was going through with the, with the Pharisees and, and, and whatnot in Jerusalem. And so we get to this story in John 9. And you'll see it on the screen. Feel free to follow along. If you've got an iPhone or whatever, you're welcome to use those too. And it says, As he passed by... He saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground, and he made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud, and he said to him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went, and he washed, and he came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Someone said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. And he kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how is it that your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes. And then he said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. And then they said to him, Where is he? I think this is kind of a joke, almost irony. He's like, I don't know. I didn't see him. <laughs> right? I mean, it's like you can't point him out in the crowd. But nonetheless, I digress, sorry. It just always strikes me as funny in the story. Well, then it says, then they, they, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been formerly blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus had made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees asked him again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for, for he does not keep the Sabbath. You can almost hear the disdain in that, right? But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a, a division among the Pharisees. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him, since he has opened your eyes? And he said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and, and we know that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we don't know. Nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He'll speak for himself. And it says, His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be literally kicked out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time, the Pharisees, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether this man is a sinner, I, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see they said to him, What did he do to you? How, how did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've told you already, and you wouldn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become one of his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we, we are disciples of Moses, right? We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. 
You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never, never since the, the, the world has began has it been heard of anyone who's ever opened the eyes of a man born blind. If that man were not from God, he could do nothing. So the Pharisees answered him, You were born in utter sin. And would you teach us? And so they cast him out. Again, you just hear the disdain in the Pharisee's voice. Now Jesus had heard that they had cast him out. And having found the man, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man answered, and he said, And who is he, sir, that I might believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. And the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. Nice, interesting story. And actually, if you continue reading into John 10, you'll see Jesus' commentary on this event. Now, one of the things I've experienced as I pastor church, and been in other churches pastoring, part of pastoring means you lose people. People, people you hold dear. You lose some to old age, some to disease, some to accidents. Sometimes you find yourself going, why? Right? Other times, I get to see in people's lives suffering. Sometimes even in, in children's lives. Suffering that is not of their making. Things they experience that they certainly do not deserve. And we find ourselves going, why? Right? My, my favorite Puritan theologian, uh, I've studied the Puritans a fair bit. I was in a congregational church before this, and, and so I've studied the Puritans a fair bit. And, and my favorite one of all of them is a guy by the name of John Owens. Or John Owen, I guess not plural, John Owen. And he became the vice chancellor of Oxford University in the middle of the 17th century, so back in the mid 1600s. And he was the chaplain to Oliver Cromwell. He was the man who helped arrange for the release from prison John Bunyan, if you've read Pilgrim's Progress. So this is a, an accomplished guy. Well, he, he, he got to marry the, the love and the joy of his life. He had an adoring wife. Her name was Mary Rook. And, and she bore him 11 children. But 10 of the 11 children died in infancy. The one daughter who lived, lived into being 25, 26 years old, and then she died as well. And you look at people like this great man of God, and you go, why? Why, why did this happen? And we could, of course, go on. Bad, bad things happen to God's people, to the Lord's people, even to the very best of Christ's disciples. Why? Right? It's the question of, and forgive me for using a fancy seminary word, but it's the question of theodicy. If you've never heard that word, you might want to write it down. Theodicy. It, it's the justification of the ways of God with men and women in this world. And that's really what this chapter in John is about. Why was this man born blind? Now, we know he's a man. It calls him a man. We don't know exactly how old he was, right? His parents say at one point that he's, he's of age, which means he's at least 13. I'm going to say maybe 19, 20 years old, right? He, he's been blind for quite some time. He's been blind long enough that he's no longer living off of his parents, that he's out begging in Jerusalem so that he can hopefully be able to get a, a pittance to get something to eat. He's a man who's lived all of his adult life as a beggar because back in those days, that, that's what you did. If you were, if you were disfigured or, or challenged or blind, 
There was no social security check coming your way. You went out and you sat on the side of the street. You, if you were fortunate, you could maybe get a spot up close to the temple where people might feel extra generous that day. And you would live praying and hoping somebody would just have pity on you and throw you a few coins. You had to beg for your living on the streets. And of course, the locals knew him. They'd see him sitting out on the street every day, right? They knew who he was. He was a, a familiar sight on the streets of Jerusalem. And as they're walking by, the disciples, the disciples ask this question. See, they've got a working theodicy themselves as disciples of Jesus. And their working theodicy goes something like this. What their beliefs are is basically suffering is always invariably the result of sin. That's what the disciples think. It's either your sin or it's your parents' sin, but, but in some way, shape, or form, suffering is always, without exception, the result of sin in their minds. They, they, they believe in judgment. They, they believe that, that God punishes sin and that someone had to be held responsible to blame for this suffering. Now let's look at the story because this, this, this issue is, is there. Now there's three parts to it. And the very first part of it is, is about this blind man who meets Jesus, right? And within that, there's three things that John points out to us. The first thing that John points out to us is that all this happens on the Sabbath day, right? Did you catch that? I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I do want us to note it. It says in verse 14 that John carefully records for us that it was the, the Sabbath day when this is going on. And, and if you've been here, you know uh, there's already been some controversy going on between Jesus and the Pharisees about the Sabbath day and, and what Jesus' attitude was towards the Sabbath day. And as you read the story, it's almost as if you feel a little bit like Jesus is almost picking a fight, right? He, he, he's kind of going out of his way a little bit to make some trouble on the Sabbath, to agitate and aggravate the Pharisees. And if you follow the issue of the Sabbath through the rest of the book of John, you, you'll see that, that it is this issue that is the issue. It's the very issue that will bring Jesus down in the end. This is the issue of, of the Sabbath. This is the issue that really gets under the skin of the Pharisees. And that's why they're beginning, even at this point, to plot his destruction. Secondly, in this part, I want you to notice the the conversation about the blind man's condition. The disciples ask about this man's condition. Who sinned, right? Their theodicy is kind of this workaday, familiar kind of thing that without, without exception, somebody is to blame, right? There's always somebody to blame. There's, there's somebody who sinned to cause this. You might not remember what the sin is, you might not even know that you were doing a sin at the time. You might have committed some sort of sin back in your childhood. Maybe you did something silly in your adolescence. Maybe it's your parents' sin. But one way, shape, or form, somewhere, some way, somehow, somebody sinned, and whatever's happened is a result of that sin, right? That's what they're saying, that there's a direct connection between sin and suffering. And by the way, that's the very same theology of Job's comforters. We studied Job in our Wednesday Bible study recently, and you'll know comforters is probably a generous thing. They weren't very comforting to poor old Job. But that's what they were saying there. And, and we oftentimes say this too. Things, things aren't going well. There's trouble. There's some sort of difficulty. And we say, I must have done something wrong, right? We almost instinctively say that. Now to be fair here, and to be biblical, sometimes this is the case. Sometimes sin indeed can be directly corrugated, correlated to suffering. But it's not the case here in this story. It wasn't the case in the book of Job. But sometimes that is the case. God does sometimes visit his wrath upon us because of our sins. 
So sometimes there is a connection between suffering and sin, but sometimes there's not. And in this particular instance, Jesus isn't interested at all in answering the question that's asked of him. Who sinned? Right? Whether it was this man, whether it was his parents. Jesus is more concerned to answer the question, how can God be glorified in this troubled situation? Oh, how I, how I wish that we, all of us, could adopt that viewpoint in, in the midst of trouble and trials and difficulties of our lives. Instead of what we tend to do is wallowing in sorrow or, or grief or, or self-pity. Asking, how can God be glorified despite what may be going on temporarily with me? How can God be glorified in this experience, in this position? How can I make much of Jesus in my cancer, in my job loss, in my pain, in my suffering? How can I glorify God despite the circumstances? Now, what can God do about this man's blindness? You see, Jesus doesn't take the viewpoint here that there's no purpose in this blindness. He says very clearly, in fact, in answer to these disciples, these things, th this man's blindness, these things have happened in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, this guy's been living without sight all of his life. 15, 20 years or more. Who knows? Long time, though. And the reason for this is that, that, that God's glory might be displayed through him. That there is a, a, a purpose to this man's suffering. Because suffering always has a purpose. There's always a reason. But that doesn't mean we will know the reason frustrating as that may sometimes be. But in this case, we do know the why. Though they've been waiting for something like 20 years, like I said, for an answer to this very question. What is God's purpose in this man's blindness? God's purpose is to, to provide a, a remarkable illustration of the gospel itself. There's a divine purpose at work here. God is going to use it to glorify himself. Now, did you notice what Jesus did to this man? It's the third thing I want you to pick up in this part. He gives him a, a tactile sign by touching his eyes, anointing his eyes with clay. Then he gives him an, an audible sign. He says to the young man, after he's touched him, he says, Go and wash in the pool that's called Salome. Or, or Salome literally means scent. Go wash in the pool that's called scent. And you read that, it's like, well, that's a little odd. But when you realize that it's John who is putting this in for us here, and he's got this little part of parentheses telling us Salome means scent, it seems to begin to make a little bit more sense. Because John has been telling us something like 17 or 18 times already in the Gospel of John, that Jesus is the one who has been sent from the Father, right? Now going to that pool would remind this man of, of the mission and the person and the identity of Jesus, even though he technically had never seen him before. One of the amazing parts of the way John works, we've talked about this all the way since John 1, is John is talking about creation and recreation, right? And in creation, this man was created blind. But now he's going to be recreated by the one who is the creator, Jesus. When Jesus heals the blind man, he's restoring just a little bit of what the world ought to be like. When that young man's eyes are first opened, can you imagine the very first time he's seen his mother or his father. One of the most amazing videos I've ever seen on the internet. And you can look this up. There's videos, there's multiple videos, but one in particular is a little boy, maybe about the age of three, been deaf all of his life. And he gets the 
the hearing implant. And he's sitting there in the doctor's office. And then they turn it on. Go watch the video. Can you imagine? He's been blind. And now he sees. It's like a, a, a little foretaste of a, a glimpse of, of the glory of what heaven's going to be like, right? Imagine that. The creator of the world is in Jerusalem. And here he's come to this man and recreated in him and given him sight that he might see for the very first time. The man who's made the stars is now standing here with him, just a regular Joe, and is restoring the sight of the blind man. Now we see in the story, it's an interesting, interesting story. We, we, we see this investigation, right, by the Pharisees. And there is a dark, kind of dark side to this story. Now it's all proper... In all probability, this comes on the heels of the Feast of Tabernacles. And if you remember, remember we talked about the candles in, in the court of the women, how they, they lit everything up, and you could see it as you were coming into town in the evenings. And maybe if you were a family living in town, you'd go out of town and go look at it and see all the, the lighting up on the temple and what that would be like. And, and then, you know, we've talked about the light of the world and Jesus and all of this. And, and Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And he, of course, repeats it here in verse 5. And he says, as, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. The, the very one who is restoring light to this man's eyes. That he might see, that he may no longer walk in literal darkness. But that he may see the light for the first time. But there's this also dark side, as I was mentioning, that he was, he was restoring and recreating, but Jesus was also exposing the darkness and the hostility that was in the hearts of the Pharisees. Notice in verse 16, the Pharisees were divided. These Pharisees, they had a, a fixation about the Sabbath and about what the Sabbath means. And for them, Jesus is destroying the Sabbath. The consequence for the Pharisees is that, that Jesus is, is eventually going to destroy them of who they are. They were the religious elite and the power holders and the power brokers of the time. And Jesus is going to break all those bonds and tear all of that down. But they really chafe when he pushes against the Sabbath. For them it was like, I don't know, you, you ever, this happens to me, I... I work on cars, or maybe you work in the wood shop, or you're out gardening, and you get that little speck of something in your eye, right? Your inclination is to rub that thing, right? But if you rub it, it's only going to make things worse. You need to get it washed out. You need to go get whatever that irritant is out. Rubbing it could hurt it. Rubbing it could, in fact, you know, if uh, I've been places where you're welding and a chunk of them go flying. If you're not wearing a face mask and protection, it could get in your eye and you start rubbing something like that, or metal shavings, or rust from under your car, you start rubbing that, it could blind you, right? And that is what you kind of see being worked out in the hearts of the Pharisees at this point. They got this little irritant Jesus in their eye about the Sabbath, and they start rubbing at that thing, right? They saw themselves as the guardians of the law. And for the Pharisees, the, the Sabbath was really about what I cannot do rather than what I can do. You know, that's the, 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 the great difference between the Pharisaical view of the Sabbath and the Christian view of the Sabbath. The Pharisees, you see, they're consumed by this question about what can't we do. One thing you couldn't do on the Sabbath, you weren't supposed to heal anybody, right? You couldn't make bread on the Sabbath. You couldn't, like, take and make dough and bake it and create some bread for your family to eat. And here comes Jesus. He comes to, 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 to pour light and to, and to pour joy into the Sabbath. To, 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 to literally transform what people experienced and believed about the Sabbath. And they, they refused to believe that this man was ever blind, right? Such a great story. And they keep on asking and asking and asking. 
They're interrogating this blind man. Notice in verse 24, they've summoned him. In verse 26, they interrogate him. In verse 28, they're basically insulting him. And then they end up excommunicating him. They kick him out of the temple, uh, out of the synagogue, right? And and I, I love that line when the blind man says to the Pharisees, why are you asking me all these questions? You want to be his disciple? You know, he kind of like, he, he's kind of poking the bear a little bit at that point. You want to be his disciples too? Why do you keep asking me about this guy? Well, I say, well, Jesus can't possibly have blessed you. You see what it is? This is a dress rehearsal for what is to come in John 18 and 19. Because the very seeds of hatred, the, the venom, the blindness, are right here in this chapter of those who will kill Jesus. And actually, there's kind of a, a double principle at work here, because Jesus will actually quote directly from Isaiah 6. He says, God has blinded their eyes so that they cannot see. He confirms them, these Pharisees, he confirms their, their blindness and their hostility. And then there's this third part of the story. And it's this blind man finally coming to faith, right? And it's a beautiful part of the story from verse 35 and onwards. And we can end with something that is so much better than, than the way the story began. Notice the, the difference of Jesus' approach to the Pharisees, where he kind of stiffens his back against them, and then he kind of bends over backwards for this blind man who has just began to see. This young man's been thrown out of the synagogue, which, don't underestimate what that means. The synagogue was everything in Jewish life. This is to be excommunicated from your community if you are thrown out of the synagogue. There is a lot at stake he just went from being blind, but being in the group, to seeing and being out of the group. So this is a significant encounter. And Jesus has heard about it, and he comes and he finds him. And watch as this man comes to an understanding of his faith. Uh, it's, it's an exciting part of the story. In verse 11 it says, the man says, it was Jesus who healed me. But he doesn't have a clue who Jesus is. He didn't see him. He just, he's like, well, some guy named Jesus was here and he did this stuff. And well, now I can see. Praise the Lord. He doesn't know where Jesus came from. All he knows is, is, is secondhand information about Jesus because he hasn't, other than had a little bit of a touch on the eyeballs, really had a direct experience with Jesus. And in verse 27, he comes under interrogation. He's like, well, He's definitely a prophet. And in verse 22, in their conversation with his parents, they begin discussing, could this be the Christ? And then down in verse 35, when Jesus asks him, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he says, well, show me where he is. And Jesus says, it's me. It's the one who's standing right here in front of you. And then the story says, and he believed, and he worshipped. You see, the story ends with those who thought, who, who believed that they could see, but are confirmed in their blindness, the Pharisees. And the one who was actually blind, having his eyes opened to understand who Jesus really is. And that's a picture of the gospel. This is how the gospel works. We are just the same. We need the touch of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit to enable us to see. And, and when our eyes are opened, what is it that we see? We see the very same thing that this man saw when he responded to Jesus and he believed and he worshipped. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. That's where those words come from. And that's where those words should lie in every one of our hearts. Because 
we, without Jesus, were blind and could not see. And the good news is there's always purpose in suffering. Some of you are going through stuff. I know you are. Troubles, suffering, frustrations, pain. Stuff not the way that it's supposed to be. And this story, this chapter in John 9 is, is written for you. It's written down to underline that God has a purpose in this. I don't necessarily know what that purpose is, and you may not know. Sometimes the purpose, though, is salvation itself like it was for this man. Sometimes it isn't for you to know, but it's for someone else to see. But know that God is in it and that God is with you. Lean into Him in your times of trial. Trust Him with your fears. Trust Him with your struggles. Know that He is working even when we don't see it. Even when we don't understand it. And then the very last thing I want you to catch here as I conclude is that this text exposes the real reason why people reject Jesus as their Savior. It's not an intellectual problem. Let me say it again. At its roots, people don't reject Jesus for an intellectual reason. That's not why they reject Jesus. It's a moral problem. Notice in the story, there was no deficiency of evidence, right? There was plenty of evidence. It's not an intellectual issue. The problem was the Pharisees rejected the sheer weight of the evidence because it didn't conform to their preconceived ideas as to the conclusion. They had devised a religious system which was outwardly, it seemed, to comply with the Old Testament, of course. But it really just defined a God that was under their control. The reason they rejected Jesus was because he didn't conform to their preferences as to what God should be like. They had created a God in their own minds and their own image rather than conforming their theology to what God had revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. And people still do that today. Oftentimes we want God to be like whatever our image of what God is, right? Whether or not that is actually who God is. But here's the thing. We don't get to decide who God is. When God doesn't conform to our preferences, the problem isn't with God. It's with us. And when that happens, when God isn't like we want Him to be, what we need to do is go to the source and see who God is. And then change our views to correspond with His Word. And see God for who He truly is. And accept that, even if we don't always like that. We may not always like who God is, but He is God, and I'm not changing Him. And if we are truly to be His followers, if He is God and I am not, we have to come to terms with that. Trusting that He is in control. That He is for you and not against you. That in fact, He loves you. If you haven't heard it today, know that Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible has told me so. And never doubt that. And He loves you so much, you can't comprehend. Each and every day, from beginning to end, He loves you. He is for you and not against you. He will not abandon you. He will not forsake you. At times when we are spiritually blind, pray that God would like just with this young man, open our eyes that we might see him rightly and fully. And then in that, that we might help others see him too. Amen. Let's pray.